First off, let me take this opportunity to welcome you to the public forum to discuss the current and proposed process for selection of Arkansas Supreme Court justices. A key part of the association's purpose is to advance and aid the courts in the fair administration of justice. We also serve the public's interest by providing a forum for discussion of subjects pertaining to the practice of law, judicial processes, and the science of jurisprudence. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with the Clinton School of Public Service to bring this discussion to the public, to the attorneys here, judges, and our House of Delegates members. The House of Delegates is the policy-making body for the association. In June of 2015, Governor Asa Hutchinson addressed the Arkansas Bar Association's annual meeting, asking the association to take leadership position in potentially revising the selection process for our Supreme Court justices. In February of 2016, the House asked past President Eddie Walker to form a task force to study our judiciary selection process. He appointed the task force for maintaining a fair and impartial judiciary. It issued a report and recommendation of June of 2016 and the House of Delegates adopted as the policy of the association, the desirability of amendment to the Constitution to provide for the selection of justices to the Supreme Court through a nominating commission appointment process, replacing the current nonpartisan election process. After that vote, I appointed a drafting task force which studied extensively and then wrote a proposed amendment for the House of Delegates to consider in a special meeting tomorrow at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock Bowen School of Law courtroom. Uh, Friday courtroom that'll begin at 1 p.m. As we open this forum tonight, I think it's appropriate to share a comment from our former Arkansas Supreme Court Justice Donald Corbin, who we lost too soon to death this week. If courts decide cases based on political pressure, then the third branch of government is going to be on a leg that is not equal to the other branches and it's pretty hard to sit on a stool that doesn't have three equal legs. Protecting our courts and that balance has been the association's guiding principle as we've gone forward in this process. We are pleased here tonight to have our distinguished panelist, and let me introduce first Justice Robert Brown on our far end. He served as Associate Justice on the Arkansas Supreme Court from 1991 to 2012. He has published and spoken widely on the topic of election of judges. He is currently counsel at Friday Eldreds and Clark Law Firm. To my immediate right, he is joined by Pulaski County Circuit Judge Mary McGowan. She has held this position since 2000. She's also president of the Arkansas Judicial Council and she serves on the Arkansas Bar Association Task Force for maintaining a fair and impartial judiciary. Next, I'll introduce you on Justice Brown's left to John Comstock, who serves as the chair of the task force for maintaining a fair and impartial judiciary, as well as the drafting task force for the proposed constitutional amendment. He is a former judge and now works as a mediator. He has devoted much time in service to the association and the science of jurisprudence. And last, I'm privileged to introduce Tim Cullen, a Little Rock attorney who focuses on appellate advocacy, business legislation, and complex civil litigation. He was an unsuccessful candidate for the Arkansas Supreme Court in 2014. We have asked these panelists to be here to share with you their perspectives and views as we approach this selection of justice question. So as we start this process, I'm gonna ask each one of them in the order that I introduce them to give first an opening statement about their views. And then as a matter of format, we will open up the program for questions from the public. So Justice Brown. 
No time limit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is on. Can you hear me? Well, I, uh, I support the, the popular election of judges, and I always have, and I do so for a number of reasons which I'll go into, but that has been the mechanism for electing justices since 1864 in this state. Uh, before that, there was a mechanism, I believe beginning with in 1836 when the Constitution was first uh, adopted for the General Assembly to uh, appoint the justices on the Supreme Court. And then it evolved to where you had a gubernatorial appointment. But that transcended into the popular election because there was some sense that maybe the some pressures were being brought to bear on the governor and the people speaking on this issue would be a safer mechanism. Uh, obviously, uh, the motto of this state is regnant populace, the people rule. I think the people ought to have a say in who is going to judge them. And that is a nice philosophical, political point. We all know the reality, though, in elections, you have the potential of money. And that's the bugaboo in popular elections. Now, some of the alternatives to popular elections I want to talk about first, and the most prevalent alternative is the Missouri Plan, which is an initial appointment by the governor, and then after a period of time, depending on what state you look to, there is a retention election. Now, that's an election, and that means you have to have money, and that means there will be ads run pro or con the particular person seeking to be retained for another term. So you don't avoid the money problem with the Missouri plan. You have a retention election. And virtually every state that has the Missouri plan has an appointment and a retention election. Now I know that what is being offered I guess by the bar and what I saw recently was a flat 14-year term. Now I don't know if the Constitution, I'm talking about the state Constitution, really addresses the possibility of a term of years. It talks about merit selection, but merit selection, if you look at the definition, includes a retention election after a period of time. So my point is, even with merit selection, the Missouri plan, you will have an election. And it makes it even worse when you don't have two opponents. In the Missouri plan or merit selection, you just have one candidate saying, I want to be retained for another term. And that's dangerous, as we've seen in states like Iowa, where the three justices seeking retention all got defeated. And they're, sub they're subjected to attack ads, dark money, the same problems that you have with uh, adversarial elections. So I support popular elections. I think there are reforms that need to be implemented if we go forward with popular elections. And I say that money is the bugaboo, and the first reform that needs to be activated is something that actually our, our state Supreme Court can do, and that is provide for the immediate uh, uh, putting on a website the immediate contributions that every person seeking uh, the, a justiceship on the Supreme Court, every contribution that that person receives. And I'm talking about instantaneous, and this will let the public know the money that is coming into that person's campaign. Now, justices have to file with the Secretary of State's office, too, but this would be in addition to that. And again, it would just be basic transparency. And if a party or a lawyer felt that that particular justice was uh, being un unfair to their particular position, then they could move for recusal. There are a lot of reforms that could be implemented. A reform to the effect that uh, any adverse ad coming in that is unidentified, such as dark money, which Tim Cullen can really speak at length about, that that has to be revealed as far as who, the, who is backing that particular entity. But 
I'm going to, I think I'm going over my time, but I'm going to stop now and I would welcome any questions on popular elections because even with some of the disadvantages you have with popular elections, I think it's preferable to the alternatives. Next would be Judge McAllen. Okay. Is this on? Well, I was thrilled when I realized Justice Brown was going to be on because I thought I won't have to say as much. Um, uh, coming on, first of all, I need to correct something. I was elected in 1990, so I've just finished my 26th year on the bench and proud of it, um, having been elected. And um, also serve Perry County. We have Pulaski and Perry County in our circuit. Uh, and I was happy, in a way, to hear um, Denise quote Justice Corbin, who uh, is looking down on us now. Uh, but I'll tell you, he's the first person to tell you he wouldn't have been on that bench if uh, we didn't have elected judges. He firmly believed in elected just justices and uh, didn't think he would have ever made it through a merit selection. Let me also tell you that I had the pleasure of serving in 2012 on a task force, a joint task force, uh, made up of judges from Judicial Council and um, lawyers from the Arkansas Bar Association, very ably chaired by Justice Bob Brown. And we began tackling a lot of the hard issues. It's a hard issue. There's no great single perfect way to uh, get judges into those positions. I mean, we all know that. Uh, I'm not so sure we know there's not a greatest way to elect a president these days either, at least with the questions again about the Electoral College. So, in any event, then it was my honor to serve on the 2016 Task Force, Fair and Impartial Judiciary, very ably chaired by John Comstock. And let me just tell you, it just knocked a hole in the spring. We met constantly, we reviewed tons and tons of material. And the vote, the split, was 11-6. Two of us represented the judges, um, Judge David Guthrie from El Dorado, who was at that time president-elect of Judicial Council, and I served as president of Judicial Council. Eddie Walker was generous and said, when I called them, if we could at least have some judicial representation. So he put us on there. Um, we heard from many, many people. I want to call out Scott Trotter, who's in the office. He did an incredible amount of work with just Chief Justice-elect Dan Kemp uh, on issues that Justice Brown just mentioned on um, recusal and on our knowing who contributes. As many of you know, or maybe you don't know, we're not supposed to know who contributes to our campaign. Now, that's just almost laughable. We have fundraisers, we're standing there, we can easily see who's in the room, but we're not supposed to know. So that's a myth that needs to be done away with, and that suggestion was also made, just like Justice Brown did, that it become just contemporaneously, because then we could see it. I want to also mention that from Justice Brown's task force, a group formed to do rapid response, and uh, retired Justice Annabelle Clinton Tuck is in the audience. She's our chair. She, Justice Brown, me, Nate Coulter, Jim Julian, probably going to leave out some, H.T. Moore, I'm going to leave out some folks, but have formed that as a nonprofit corporation to try to respond. So I, I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to echo the fact that um, there's not a perfect way, but it, and, and we can also look how the federal courts have done it, which is, again, constitutional. It's, and I, John will tell you this, I refu those of us on the task force that favor elected refuse to call it merit, uh, because what's that mean? In whose eyes is the merit? Let's just call appointed versus elected. In any event, um, we, that was an issue that was talked about, and I tell people all the time, if you don't think there's not politics that's involved in federal appointments, you just don't know how it works. But to me, to have the ability to have to go to voters, it's not a bad thing for a lot of justices elects to have to go out, meet and greet uh, voters, sort of get to understand better what are the issues that they have. And 
I will tell you, we put it to a vote at Judicial Council, our fall meeting in October. It was a unanimous decision. Now, that's highly unusual among judges uh, at any level. But it was a unanimous decision that uh, we support elected judges by all the judges that were in attendance. Uh, and so I think with that, I'm going to let turn it over. John, you want to take it? Can you hear me? I hope you realize that there is some reluctance on the part of an attorney to take a position different than a former justice of the Supreme Court, a sitting judge of the circuit court, both who have tremendous reputations in this state for integrity, intellectual acumen, I mean, all the criteria that, would, that we would ask ourselves, what is it that qualifies as a good jurist? These two satisfy. But I do have a different opinion. And uh, I've, I've take, I was asked to be a chair of a task force for the Bar Association. Um, I have to admit, I probably didn't realize all that was involved at the time when I said yes. But, but let me share a couple things with you. First, um, it, it's easy for me to kind of respond to just a couple points that were made first, and then I'd like to share a, a general observation with you. And then I'd like to briefly tell you what does the recommendation propose. And at this point, it's not the Bar Association's proposal. That will be decided tomorrow at the House of Delegates meeting. It is a proposal of a task force. Um, now, I will tell you, the Bar Association House of Delegates last June voted overwhelmingly to say yes to the bar president, form a committee, go draft a constitutional amendment that provides for the, I'll, I'll use the phrase that, that Judge McGowan does, is, is more comfortable with, and I understand why, that goes with nominating commission and appointment. And the, and, and the Bar Association House of Delegates gave us that direction. So what, what I will present to you and try to just briefly explain to you is the work product that, that we came up with as a result of a commission that was given to us that we took on and felt honor bound to, to develop a response that tried to achieve the very best of, of how do we go about selecting our judges. And by the way, when the original task force was formed, the question was judges. S district, circuit, court of appeals, and justices. But that got whittled down, narrowed down by the House of Delegates to justices of the Supreme Court. We will continue, regardless of what happens tomorrow in the House of Delegates, circuit judges, Judge McGowan's position will continue to be elected at the local level, district judges at the local level. Court of Appeals, who, who get elected from a smaller geographic, they're not statewide elections, they will continue to be elected. We're only talking about the, the, uh, the justices that serve on our Supreme Court and how do we go about making that selection. Um, I know sometimes the word merit, and because when you see this reported in the paper a lot of times, you will hear it called, as, as Justice Brown said, the Missouri Plan you'll hear it called merit selection. And, and, and I just want to explain that term because it, it's literally 20 plus years old, but that term merit at the time was used to differentiate between po political elections and selecting judges based on their merit, their qualifications. So all of us on this panel support the merit selection of judges and justices. I'm confident of that. It's just how do, how, do you, how do you use that word? Amendment 80, which kind of put us on, Amendment 80 to the Arkansas Constitution, which put us on this path, uses the word merit selection, says, to Justice Brown's point, the people did speak in that amendment, and they said, at some point in the future, Arkansas may be, want to re-examine whether or not we want to adopt, quote, merit selection. But for ease of reference, I do, I, I accept the premise that we ought to talk in terms of nominating commission and appointment process because that's really kind of the gist of what, of what this model is based on. Keep in mind, we're not, 
we're not diving off of the end of a cliff here either. There's 22 or 23 states that that elect their their highest uh, justices in their in their state. Um, they, for the most part, have good track records. Now, Justice Brown mentioned to you that most of them uh, have what's called a retention election, and that's right. And what we heard from all the people that came and talked to us, particularly national folks that looked across the spectrum of all the states, what we heard was in years past, these retention elections used to kind of be sleepy elections. They weren't controversial. The money was still being spent on the original campaign, but the retention elections kind of went by the wayside. That's not the case anymore, and hasn't been for a number of years, particularly since the Citizens United case. They now have become, it's like a, a magnet, and, and the, the money that comes from out of state particularly that wants to influence, that wants to select the next justice of the Arkansas Supreme Court, they in essence put their hat in the ring in a big, big way. If I could just give you a comparison, there's three justices. Just think of this, in the state of Arkansas, you can raise, there's kind of a, almost a natural ceiling as to how much money you can raise in a campaign. Uh, whatever that might be, it's based on the population that we have. But let's say that money comes up to this point. The dark money comes in and spends this much. And I'm just saying that figuratively. But they overwhelm what the campaigns themselves raised. And what do they do? Do they support a candidate? No. Not in the last three cycles. What they did is they attacked one candidate. They, they, some people would call it character assassination. Some would say maybe that's too strong of a word. But they certainly slandered the individuals. They, 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 they created all kinds of innuendos against those individuals. And they did it overwhelmingly. One, one justice in about a 30-day period had over 1,400 TV spots purchased against this justice. And this justice did lose. Anyway, the point is, is that what we in the Bar Association and what the House of Delegates and the bar attorneys across the state, I think, saw something is out of kilter with, with the way we're selecting justices. And, and at some point, is there an untoward influence on these outside people who are willing to, to spend, it seems like, whatever it takes to, to malign one candidate to where the public is, doesn't, it, we would, I would submit to you, the public generally wants to do the right thing, but when it comes to a justice of the Supreme Court, it is very, very difficult for them to figure out between those TV spots, what is the truth? What do I do? It's hard enough for them, for you, at the district judge level, think about it. The district judge is the closest one to us, the misdemeanor courts, the city courts, and even those. Most of my friends ask me, John, please tell me who to vote for, because I know nothing about these district judges. Um, let me go on to one, one last, just a responsive comment to the, to the contemporaneous reporting of campaigns that Justice Brown mentioned. This is something that you can all get behind. We should all support this strongly regardless whether it's judicial campaigns. We're still going to have judicial campaigns even if we change the way we select justices. But the contemporaneous reporting of campaign contributions is a huge uh, benefit to our system, and there's, there, there will be, I think, some legislation submitted this session, and I would really encourage you to, to, uh, to support it, actively support it. Um, okay, let's just talk briefly about the, the proposal, because I want you to understand if you've not read the documents, and they're all out there. But bottom line is, for justices, we wouldn't elect. There wouldn't be a general election, the need to raise all the money. You'd have a nominating commission. Our proposal suggests nine voting members, one by the governor, I'm sorry, two by the governor, one by the leader of the Senate, one by the leader of the House, three by the Arkansas Bar Association, two by the Arkansas Supreme Court. I hope that equals nine. And, and, and one non-voting member would be the Chief Justice or the Chief Justice designee to be the, the chairman of the commission. Um, the, 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 the purpose of the commission, these would be people who are, know what it takes, what is involved in being a justice, knows what the kind of the credentials, the qualifications are. People would apply for the position. If an opening came up, attorneys across the state who believe they qualify would apply. There would be a vetting process, an interview process, all of it transparent to the public. There would be public sessions where the public could come and participate in those sessions. 
What we heard from the national folks was that that is key to this whole process of nominating commission appointment process working is be very transparent about all of it. Um, the, the commission would come up with three qualified names that they would submit to the governor. The governor would have 30 days to make an appointment and, and if the governor didn't, then it would default back to the commission to make that appointment. The Justice uh, Brown made the comment about the term, and, and this is different, and I, I hope you will go out of this room and refer to the Arkansas plan. The Missouri plan, it's on the shelf and it's been used by a lot of people, but it is the past. The Arkansas plan could be not just the beginning right here, but the future. Here's how it's different, that one 14-year term we did not make the proposal of a, of a retention election. And that is because what we learned was, as I've said before, the retention elections have become the magnet for the, for the dark money. Extremely contentious elections, um, over a million dollars routinely being spent on judicial races uh, for a justice of the Supreme Court. Um, and let me assure you of this, all of the sitting justices will of course fill out their elected terms and then those same justices would be uh, uh, available to ask uh, or to submit their names for, for an appointment process should they decide they want to do that. Uh, the idea would be too, those first few appointments that are made, they would be a little bit staggered. They each wouldn't be 14 years. It's spelled out in the constitutional amendment, but the purpose of that is so that we would eventually get it to a cycle where you would have a new justice coming on the bench every two years. That's the goal and the math will, and the timeline will play out that way. Um, let, me, let me just, if I could, um, uh, share with you a quote. Uh, this is actually from former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. But the legitimacy of the judiciary rests on its promise to be fair and impartial. A judge's sole constituency should be the law. Um, I would submit to you that this proposal seeks to achieve that. Um, I, I asked the question of my, or my, actually my 17 year old stepson asked me the question, at what point? Early on, what are you working on? And I told him, and he said, well I know the easy objection. And I said, what is it? And he said, you're taking away my right to vote. And I said, okay, is there an easy answer? And he said, yeah. And I'm paraphrasing now, he might be listening. Uh, but. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but, but he said something like this. If you were going to the hospital and you, you had a, a, a head brain injury and you needed to be seen by the head of the neurosurgery department, would you want that doctor to be somebody who, who went out to the breakfasts and the pancake breakfasts and the different places, shook hands and, and solicited contributions indirectly through a campaign staff? Or would you want somebody who's been vetted by professionals, interviewed by professionals, people that know what's required to be head of neurosurgery so that they can actually judge your qualifications? Which, which doctor, which, which neurosurgeon would you want? And I said, Mike, that's, I thought that was a good response. I think actually that's what this boils down to. We do believe that a nominating commission appointment process is a good effective way to achieve uh, uh, fair and impartial merit selected judges. Thank you. All right, Tim. I think it's all been said, Denise. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna read a couple of quotes. One of them's from you, Justice Brown. <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> kind of where this started um, was well before my race in 2014. In 2010, one of the commissions that studied all this um, wrote a report to the Bar Association and then Chief Justice Hanna and Justice Brown authored an article in the Arkansas Lawyer and they previewed the problem that we're all trying to deal with. And the quote is this, millions of dollars were being spent in races for state Supreme Court positions and the television advertisements being run were pernicious, poisonous, and outright falsehoods. Though this malady had not yet affected Arkansas, we believe that it was only a matter of time before the torrent of money and toxic ads inundated our state. And that was, that was prescient. Um, that's exactly what happened in uh, 2014 in my race. I'd rather not talk about that unless I have to. It's it kind of got some not good memories about it. A better example, I think, is a relatively famous case out of West Virginia, Caperton versus Massey. 
a little aside, I saw that uh, Don Blankenship, who was the CEO of Massey, he's in jail right now for mine safety violations, so maybe there's a little justice in the world. Um, but the Caperton versus Massey uh, probably inspired John Grisham's book, The Appeal. And basically what you had was an election in West Virginia for um, an appellate court that was going to review a $50 million jury verdict against one of these companies, and I can't keep them straight. Um, the CEO, Don Blankenship, uh, spent $3 million to get his candidate elected. His candidate then sat on the court and reviewed the case, and lo and behold, voted to reverse the jury verdict. Now, I'm not accusing anybody of anything untoward, but that is the type of situation that it doesn't matter whether it was crooked or not, it's the appearance. And that's why our rules of conduct speak in terms of not impropriety, but the appearance of impropriety. And that's why the judicial system is different. Congress can uh, you know, do whatever they want in trying to represent their constituents' interests. Uh, but the judiciary doesn't have constituents. The only constituent for the judiciary is, is the law. Statutes, constitution, case law. So John Roberts, uh, Chief Justice, commented on that in his opinion in the williams U. Lee case. He said, judges are not politicians, even when they come to the bench by way of ballot. And a state's decision to elect its judiciary does not compel it to treat judicial candidates like campaigners for political office. A state may assure its people that judges will apply the law without fear or favor and without having personally asked anyone for money. I think we're all trying to get at the same thing here, which is to protect the independence and the integrity of our judiciary, because that's, that's the only legitimacy that the judiciary has, is their independence. Um, they don't have the, the executive power, they don't have the legislative power, they have the power, the important power to review statutes and cases and decide cases and controversies. But without the public's confidence in that, it'll never work. So we've had the last three elections for Supreme Court and um, the influence of outside groups, as, as John mentioned, in each case, they've spent more than the actual candidates did combined. Um, and we've got TV receipts from TV stations to prove it. And these outside groups, you know, it's not like outside group whenever somebody's from Texas, we Arkansans say they're outsiders, you know. It's not that. These are fronts. They're shadowy, uh, unknown entities. No one knows who's behind them. Uh, the, the group in my election that spent approximately $400,000 to make sure I was defeated, uh, operates at the time out of a little storefront in McLean, Virginia, and m several people tried to ferret them out. Uh, that storefront is empty now. A documentary filmmaker went there in the past year and it's just empty. Uh, the landlord doesn't have any forwarding address for them. They, their only address is a P.O. box. They have a fancy website, but it never changes. Um, they claim to be affiliated with law enforcement somehow, but I've never met any law enforcement officer that's actually a member. So it leaves the public asking the question of who are these people and why do they care so much about who our judges and justices are? And that is what creates the appearance of a problem. And that's what threatens the independence and the integrity of the judiciary. And I applaud um, everyone on this panel and many people in this room for trying to find some answers to that. And I agree, it's, it's a multi-factorial thing. Uh, Transparency in donations and, and instant reporting of donations is a great idea that everybody ought to be able to get behind. Um, the rapid response team is a great idea. Um, and that is in place. And that's people trying to improve the situation and the problem. Uh, the bar has committed a great deal of time to this. And John and his committee have done a ton of work and reviewed a lot of material. And those people are all earnestly striving for the same goal even if they disagree about how to get there. And uh, several state legislators have taken interest. Uh, the, don't remember if it was House or Senate. Ju Senate Judiciary had a hearing on this particular topic. And uh, Jeremy Hutchinson was interested in it. Uh, Matthew Shepard has long been interested in this. And uh, Clark Tucker was interested. He had a similar situation in, in his recent election. 
and the governor's taken an interest in it. So it's a problem. Uh, there's, a, I think, a universal consensus that it's a problem. I've heard very few people stand up for the idea that an unknown outside group ought to be able to spend a million dollars in an election and say anything they want, um, and there's no recourse and no accountability. I've never heard anyone advocate that position. I suppose maybe there's a theoretical uh, Citizens United kind of basis for that, that, you know, that's free speech. Well, you know, it almost gets to the point of yelling fire in a movie theater. Is that free speech? No. There are reasonable limits, and there have to be reasonable limits, particularly in judicial races, because, again, it goes back to the, the essential aspect of independence and integrity of the judiciary. So if our judicial races start to look like uh, a congressional race where people are just lobbing ridiculous accusations at each other and making silly you know, innuendos based on who the president is and things like that, people aren't going to respect the judiciary anymore. And the judiciary is going to lose that essential thing that is necessary for it to function. So maybe that's a kind of overview of, of my thoughts on this. And they've evolved. And, uh, you know, like John, I think it's a compelling sort of counter argument that, well, you're going to take away our vote. I hope it doesn't come down to that. I hope the uh, Bar Association House of Delegates, and I hope the voters eventually get to choose on this, and I hope they realize it's a lot more sophisticated than that. It is more like the surgeon example. Um, and another just sort of rhetorical way that I look at it is um, appointed judges and justices were good enough for Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton and some of those guys. And, you know, that's been going on since... Uh, 1780s, I guess, and that's worked out pretty well. And the federal judiciary is not perfect, but everyone agrees that they go to great lengths to be insulated from politics, and that's part of the lifetime appointment in the federal judiciary. And that's something the commission has come up with here that I think is a good idea, is a 14-year term. It's long enough that they can serve a significant amount of time and make a difference and probably qualify for retirement. Um, and it avoids the problem of retention elections. So there are lots of ways to uh, dissect this proposal, and I don't know if we're going to get into that, but I would encourage you not to make perfect be the enemy of good and to recognize that everyone here is striving for the same goal, um, and I hope we can find more than one answer to it. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. One of the uh, things that the Bar Association wanted to do once we realized that we were moving forward after the vote of the House of Delegates in June of 2016 is we wanted to have the opportunity for the public to ask questions and to gain information. So this is now your turn. Is there anyone that has a question you'd like to direct? Yes, sir. Well, of course, in the current system in which we elect judges in Arkansas, and I'm, I'm not an attorney, but I do know there is a bar association rule that limits what a judicial candidate can say out on the, um, out on the campaign trail. Am I correct? It's a judicial canon. It's not the bars. It's judges. Judicial canon that limits. Can't talk about. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I heard you. Yes. Okay. Now, let's contrast with the system that is used to appoint justices to the federal judiciary, in which they have to answer specific questions from Congress. In many cases, I think you might agree, we actually will know, the public will know more about the background and philosophy of nominees to the federal judiciary than we know about judicial candidates we elect here in Arkansas. How is the Bar Association going to create any more of an informed populace with regard to Supreme Court justices who sometimes have as much influence on our lives as members of the legislature? Let, let me attempt to answer that in the process. Once folks apply through the nominating process and are being considered for um, an interview. Those interviews are now public record 
they're open to the public so that you can attend those um, interviews. And everyone that applies will know that their materials will be made public if they are selected. They meet the threshold to be considered for an interview. There is a uh, list of, in essence, qualifications or characteristics that we look for in a uh, justice. And I anticipate that the nominating commission will then formulate questions that relate to the job. But that is something, pardon me? The philosophy as it relates to the law. Yes. And not to politics, I'm assuming. All right, another question? Let me comment on, on that one question, though, because I think that really gets to the, the meat of the coconut. Uh, I think the public has to know uh, who the candidates are and what they stand for. They can't comment, the candidates cannot comment on something that's likely to come before them, but they certainly can give background information and, and whatever, and I think that's critically important. And one of the things that one of our task forces in the past 2012 recommended was that there be a website with information about the candidates and I think the candidates traveling around the state it, it may seem like a carnival but it's really not it's educational for the the candidate to get out in the state it's education for the people to see the candidate you know hands-on and I think that's vitally important and in the process, you learn more and more about judicial candidates, especially now. 20 years ago, not so much. You asked your lawyer who, they, who you should vote for. Not today. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Uh Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out uh, tonight. My name is Josh Steiner. I'm a first-year student here at the Clinton School. And I guess just to follow directly with that question, so uh, I'm fairly new to Arkansas. I've only been here about four months, and I know very little about this process. Uh, would you say that, just again, following along with this question, that once this information is available, that the public generally accesses it? And if so, to what degree? Are you talking, are you talking about ba background information about the judicial candidates? Yes. More and more. And the websites are put up, but the press, of course, has been the purveyor of that information in the past. Uh, what we try to do with our task force and our 501c corporation, nonprofit corporation, is make information about judicial candidates available to the public. Now, just being brutally frank, there are a lot of people in Arkansas who don't have access to computers. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's not the, uh, the be all end all of the problem. But more and more information is being made available to the public at large. And again, that's been the duty of the press in the past. Now it's the duty of a lot of other people, including the Bar Association. Can I weigh in on that? Sure. I'm going to disagree gently with you, Justice Brown. Um, sure. Gently. Um, and, you know, maybe this is a little inside whatever, but the carnival show of going around the state and speaking at pancake suppers and breakfasts and county committee meetings and things like that, I don't have any problem at all with that. But more and more judicial candidates are expected to behave like other candidates. And by that I mean they're expected, to, it, it, typically when you go to a civic club or something you're campaigning, those people have an agenda. They care about something. It's either the Republican County Committee or the Democratic County Committee, and you're walking a tightrope to not get into politics with them. But they ask you things to try to probe at your politics because they think that matters. And it's difficult to stand in front of a room and tell people that what you think doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter if I'm an R or a D. And it's difficult to explain to them that we decided that a long time ago in Amendment 80 and said judges are not going to run as partisan candidates. But still, people are partisans. And they see this as an election process and they expect you to act like everybody else that comes before them in an election. And so it puts a candidate in a terrible position. And um, you'll see a lot of things that are, you know, hints, I guess. You'll see a lot of candidates with pictures of themselves and guns. 
You know, it's just a picture, right? It's a picture that says a thousand words. Um, you'll see pictures of candidates with other Supreme Court justices. You know, that, I thought that was a pretty clever thing is on the campaign at one of those events, I was trying to walk that line and trying to not get into politics and somebody asked me, who is your favorite United States Supreme Court justice? That's a litmus test, you know? And I feel like a, a, a heel for refusing to answer, but um, that's people dragging our judicial candidates into politics. And it's, it, it puts the candidates in a terrible position as far as I'm concerned. Can I make one comment? One rebuttal. Yes, sir. <laughs> this, will be 30, this will be 30 seconds. Uh, look at what happens with the uh, Senate confirmation hearings with the presidential appointment. You talk about litmus tests. <laughs> this would be preferential. I think going out to the public is preferential. I, one thing I would suggest that we keep in mind is just think about this. Do we, this is the question to ask, do we want our judges to be politicians? If we do, then leave it as it is, more of the same. But if we don't, because think about what does it mean to run a political race? Why do people donate to politicians? They want two things. They want access to that politician and they want to have an impact on policy. Maybe some little specific policy that impacts their bottom line, but that's generally what they want, access and, and the ability to influence. And I would just submit that, that just uh, as was just noted, if somebody stands in front of a judge, what would we think if a judge said, hold it, before I make my decision, could you tell me, are you a D or an R? I'm just curious. What would we think? We would be appalled by that. We actually do need judges who actually stand a little higher really, uh, like on a pedestal higher in terms of integrity, in terms of impartiality, in terms of, uh, of, of fairness. They really do need to be a little bit removed. John, I want to recognize Justice Tuck for a question or comment. Let me get Let's a mic. get a voice. Um, I've been listening to the conversation and I've been in Iran you know, on a party ticket the first couple of times, and then I ran as a nonpartisan after Amendment 80. And I've often thought about this question that happens many times to judicial candidates. Um, well, what is your position on such and such? And I've been asked this question. And, you know, I've always thought that what people wanted of the court system was fair play. And they didn't want a judge who had already prejudged things based on a philosophy before even hearing a word from the bench or reading a brief. And I thought about, you know, our judges have a First Amendment right now under Minnesota v. White and others, to mouth off. But the question is, is that good judgment? Because that's not our role. Our role is to give due process to all litigants, rich or poor, wherever they come from. And I always found that the litigants in my trial court and the litigants before the appellate courts they wanted to know that they had been heard. So when you would give an opinion, you'd go through their arguments and you'd explain why you accepted or didn't. In appellate opinions, you did the same. And so after thinking, you know, if I was gonna run again under this new regime of mouthing off, I was going, I was going to have a short, you have to have a short answer, okay? It can't be legalese. I said, I presume you want to have a judge who hasn't made up his or her mind before you've ever seen that person and heard, and heard the evidence. So I think you want someone that has not closed the book before they've even opened the book. And now that may be naive, but I decided that was the way I was going to handle those questions. And if the people decided they wanted politicians, 
then they would not get me. But I really felt that in terms of the judicial trust factor of due process, I mean, I know a lot of people around here and a lot of lawyers who advocate all kinds of sides. That's what they're hired to do. But I decided I was going to sit there and say, hey, that's not my role. My role is to hear you fair and square without having made up my mind. Now, I know about the Senate confirmation hearings, but you've got to remember the U.S. Supreme Court actually makes policy. In the final analysis, the cases that come before Supreme Courts are not easy cases. They're tough cases, and they're, they're questions that people could argue about till the cows come home, but somebody has to make a call, and with, with reasoning. We can all agree to disagree, but somebody has to make the decision for this society at this time. So I'm sorry, I just had to say something. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't go without it. <laughs> I will add one addendum to Justice Ember's comments, and that is uh, not all of us who serve on the judiciary in Arkansas are politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I, amen to that. I was going to say the same thing. I certainly don't think of myself as a politician, and I did not run a statewide race, but I ran a two-county race and, uh, and was proud to run as a Democrat before we switched into Amendment 80 um, and never felt like I was asked or something about any litmus test or whatever. I wanted to go back, though. Actually, it's a comment Tim made that we don't represent people. We actually do. That was a opinion by the late Justice Scalia, who found that if you're elected judges, you represent a constituency, and under the Voting Rights Act established a case then that came about in Arkansas called Hunt. It was Eugene Hunt that sued out of Pine Bluff. And we have in counties throughout the state of Arkansas, again, this is the trial bench, not an appellate bench, but we have dedicated sub-districts for the election specifically of minority justice judges. And I know there's concern, there's been concern that's been um, stated openly that if you get into this nominating process, you will lose what diversity we have on the bench by virtue of who's making the appointments. And I, and I do want to th ask one question and then I'll be quiet, but that is on, I read the, the drafting group's um, recommendations. And let me tell you, they had a huge hurdle because the task force may have voted 11-6 appointment, but could never agree, never had a majority as to how it would be structured, that the governor would make the appointment with the advice and consent of the Senate, or with there's a nominating commission, or whatever. There's never a clear majority, and frankly, I think some of us, we ran out of time because they wanted it by June 1. But in any event, the, the question then becomes whether or not you're going to be able to have any kind of diversity, and looking, I just, I'm not sure because I did the drafting task force, but I know that was two members specifically on the task force spoke about the fact that we didn't have, we were not having as many representatives, uh, certainly from minority groups. So um, I, I think, again, if you have races, then you may be able to elect some. So. I, I, I hesitate again. I, don't, I, I just want to, I know Judge McGowan definitely did not intend to get this statement wrong, so I know she'll treat me kindly when she goes back to read it. But actually, we did, the task force did clearly say we want a nominating commission. That was resolution number two, and not only a nominating commission, but one that would interview and submit three names to the governor. Um, if you look at the constitutional amendment we proposed, and you go back and look at resolution numbers one and two, you will see that we covered a lot of the bases. The, the one little pocket that was really left and answered and we really did struggle with was do we do retention elections or something else? It was that piece 
that that and that had John. To be let me through. say, I, you, I I misspoke or didn't make myself clear. We never got into one term, fourteen years. There are a lot of things in this drafting proposal that we never voted on as a task force, and and understandably because you've got to have something that you're taking to the Board of Governors and then as a proposed amendment. So I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to imply there wasn't a nominating commission. It was just in the details that are set out. Definitely. The, that's right. I mean, the 14-year term, that was the big deal. Do we do retention? Do we not? We did not have a majority uh, originally from the, from the task force. Hi, my name is John DePippa. I was on the drafting committee. And for everybody here and also those listening at home, I'm speaking as a private citizen and not an employee of the University of Arkansas system or the William H. Bowen School of Law. So I can keep my job tomorrow. Um, notwithstanding my great respect for Justice Brown and Judge McGowan, I've always supported judicial nominations, not elections. But I think it's particularly important going forward that we have a nomination. Judicial elections have served us well in Arkansas. But I think when you look forward, there are a number of things that concern me. Um, one, and Justice Tuck mentioned it, the Minnesota versus White case really opens up the door for a lot of conversation and a lot of advocacy by judicial candidates, so long as they stop short of saying, I'm going to rule in favor of your case. And I think you're going to see just judicial candidates pushing that limit more and more. And it wouldn't surprise me if there are even more things opened up um, in the area of the First Amendment. The second would be Citizens United and the influx of money. Those things are only going to get worse from my perspective. And so I don't think we can rely on our past history of good judicial elections to continue forward. Past results don't guarantee future performance in this case. The second thing that concerns me and why I think judicial elections um, should go by the way and we move to a nomination process is that we don't live in a world in which the pancake suppers and breakfast make much of a difference anymore. It's a digital communications universe and information can be spread and distorted quite rapidly. And I think Tim found that in his race, but we also saw it in the presidential race where the actions of the lawyers on the Democratic ticket, uh, Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine, were distorted. Um, and we know as lawyers that they were doing their jobs in their cases, but they were distorted in a way that I think the general public may not understand. So when you combine the increased freedom of judicial candidates to speak freely, uh, when you combine the flow of money that is likely to go into these races and the instantaneous communications that can be rapidly distorted, um, I think moving to a nominating process isn't perfect, but I think it offers us an opportunity to get ahead of the rest of the country and really put in something that's unique and I think can support and protect the integrity and independence of the judiciary. All right, let me first. Well, far be it for me to disagree with the dean, <laughs> but you make, you make telling points. I guess it's where I begin, and that is not to limit the pool of the candidates or the people who could be justices on the Supreme Court. And under this process, initially it's limited to three people and you don't know who is influencing the nominating commission or ultimately the governor. And that's, that's troublesome, very troublesome to me. So I would rather start with what we have and reform it dramatically. No question needs to be reformed. But we just have two different starting points. But I've always respected your views, so thank you. Weird. As, as one uh, on the outside looking in and reviewing uh, the proposal. Judge uh, McGowan's comment about uh, uh, the talent time and uh, the documents reviewed to reach this point uh, hit home. Um, uh, such that I want to express my appreciation for the attention to this issue as published, the cost of campaigning and out-of-state influence. And this uh, forum, this panel, this discussion, 
has provided uh, for me uh, some insight and comfort that I didn't have when I was alone at home reading the proposal. Nonetheless, I oppose any proposal that transfers my vote to a committee of unknowns. Unknown if the committee is ethnically and gender as gender diverse as Arkansas. It, it seems that what is being, the attempt is being made to address the wolf at the front door. Simultaneously, you're creating a whiff, wolf which is approaching the back door in the form of partisan politics. I find it difficult to accept that members of the nominating committee can be nominated by someone in political office and that you totally avoid politics at some point. My concern and uh, the issue for me was why not just address what the published concern is as opposed to developing this process. I, I like what Judge Brown said, his suggestion about publishing financial information on a website. But I would go so far as to add that other methods of information ought to be distributed, used for distribution. And because not everyone goes to the website and my sense is that I doubt that any information in this regard will uh, go viral. I, I uh, think that the proposal, I know that, the proposal is thought provoking. It's not the solution. We have a time frame that was established for us of one hour. We are beyond that, but I'm told by the dean I can have one more question. Um, mine wouldn't necessarily be in the form of a question. I, I uh, in a little bit of promotion, um, I am um, a citizen, not an attorney, and um, I am also proudly a vice president of an organization that has made a substantial effort to try to address what I believe the public wants. I don't think that this proposal takes the money nor the politics out of the judicial system. What I do think would help is to empower the people. The organization I'm referring to is called American Found Foundation for Judicial Accountability. I would ask all of you to strongly look at how that might fit in providing the public what it is that they want to have in order to make a good decision about who's going to say what happens with their lives. Um, and I also want to say, I know this is, it's interesting to hear the points about how being out there at the, at the pancake breakfasts and how people want to frame. And so I appreciate the effort that people have made. I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to, to be able to speak in front of you. The Arkansas Bar Association has been in existence in this state since 1898. We continue to be here and we anticipate being here ad infinitum. We serve an important public function in addressing these issues. We also share the concern and the interest in the Judicial Code of Conduct that says to the greatest extent possible, we want judges and judicial candidates to be free and appear to be free from political influence and political pressure. We all share that common goal to protect the judiciary from politicization. And so I appreciate your attendance here today and your thoughts and your study on this issue as we have. Thank you.